Uh, I'm Frank Cho, and uh, you're watching Gen Mint. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the channel. I'm your boy, Gem Mint, for what might be the last new comic book day reviews for quite some time. As you guys are aware, this is the last diamond shipment until everything gets back to normal from, from this whole pandemic. So I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if we're going to get digital. I don't know when Diamond will resume shipping new books. So enjoy this one because, like I said, it could be the last one for quite some time. But this is the new comic book day reviews for Wednesday, March 25th. We're going to keep it spoiler free. Before we get into this, I got a couple of things. First of all, our boys at KRS Comics have three exclusives that they're dropping today at 2 p.m. Two of them were going to be MegaCon exclusives, but being that that event's canceled, they're dropping them all today. The first one is the Catwoman MegaCon exclusive. Beautiful oversized book with that magazine vibe. That's a $30 book. Then the Clayton Crane Venom 25 issue, which is also an oversized issue at $30. And man, this thing looks awesome with the trade dress and the final artwork. Looks amazing. And then they have a regular exclusive that drops today. This is the Ghost Spider Mike Mayhew cover. And it's $15 for cover A, $40 for the A and B set, which is uh, the trade dress and the virgin. Use the code GEMMINT at checkout and save yourself 15%. Plus, you can use that code. It's good for anything on the store. Also, our boys at ThatSpidermanBooth.com have a new giveaway prize for this current mystery box. This box runs from today until Saturday, March 28th. It's a $30 mystery box. Use the code GEMMIN at checkout and you can save yourself $10. You're going to get five comics of retail value. One lucky winner is going to get this amazing Spider-Man 300. CGC 9.2, signed by Todd McFarlane and Stan Lee. All right, guys, so I only read one image title this week. I read On the Stump. I read it digitally, and this is an enjoyable book. It's kind of everything that the first issue was, just continuing forward with this story here. It has a certain formula, too. It's got, like, a little fighting and vulgarity in the beginning. It gets super brutal at the end. What I really like about it, it's politicians trying to pass bills and trying to pass laws but they get them passed by winning in a battle, right? You have to fight to pass these bills. And what I liked about this one is like these two politicians had to go up against this judge. And when the judge didn't like what he said, he beat his ass. So it's kind of like high school rules, man, or like middle school rules. Like talk that shit is going to be a fight. This is no debate or Twitter battle like the politicians do today. It's like, no, you're going to have to come and see me. So on the stump, issue two was, was good. All right, and then from IDW, we have Dying is Easy. This is issue four, and this is written by Joe Hill. I like this run so far. Like I mentioned in the uh, other reviews, it's this uh, ex-cop. He's trying to make it as a stand-up. He kind of looks like he might have murdered this stand-up who's stealing everybody's jokes, kind of like uh, Joe Rogan, uh, Carlos Mancia style. And, you know, he's been on the run since the last couple of issues. You see him kind of uh, evade some police officers, go back to his ex-wife's house, and things like that. It's a cool story. Kind of a, a weird artsy look. It looks like everything has this kind of, like, filtered layer over it. But uh, I do enjoy it, and it's like, dang, Joe Hill. He's writing stuff for his own comics on DC Black Label, and then he's got something on IDW as well. All right, speaking of Black Label, so DC's Black Label, Basket Full of Heads, issue 6. I'm digging this issue. If you're following the story, we get a better idea of what's going on with these crooked cops and these convicts. Still have her chopping off heads and adding them to the basket. Uh, but uh, overall, it's a good series so far. I, I definitely enjoy it. The artwork is good. It's uh, kind of a light horror, funny type of book. Uh, Joe Hill really writes some good stuff, so check it out. Last DC book, also Black Label. This is Batman Curse of the White Knight, issue 8. It's the final issue of this run. And Sean Murphy, man, he does it again. I really enjoyed the first series, White Knight. Then Curse of the White Knight really deals with the Waynes and the, um, who's the Azrael's name? Bar Barak? Anyway, um, final battle with Azrael with Azbat. It's awesome. Uh, it looks like we might have another series that spawns out of this. I don't know if this, if this was setting that up with like the trial of Bruce Wayne. Awesome, brutal battle. Artwork is incredible. Kind of interesting what they did with the backgrounds of of the Waynes here, and, and if Bruce was really a true Wayne, was was his ancestors really part of the Wayne lineage, or was there like a whole uh, old switcheroo pulled on them? <laughs> and like always, we have a ton of Marvel books. I'm going to start with all of the Dawn of X books. We have five of them, man. Check this out. So 
Let's start with Hellions number one. I was excited for this. This is by Who Wells, Segovia, and Curel. This was an awesome book. I wasn't really so hype about uh, Orphan Maker and the Nanny. They played a small background role. It wasn't kind of like how it was in the uh, in the eighties when it was so much involvement from them. But this was a really good issue, man. Havoc kind of losing his shit in the beginning and really hurting some humans. They were criminals, but he really kind of goes overboard and has to stand trial. Cyclops is pissed. And somehow Sinister kind of finagles his way to being responsible for like this uh, rough mutant outcast kind of uh, group. So Psylocke's here to keep an eye on him. Uh, Orphan Maker's part of it. He kind of went a little AWOL. So uh, really strong first issue. I was loving Hellions issue one. Wolverine issue two. This is by Percy, Kubert, and Martin. Wolverine issue two. Man, I feel like they didn't really touch on anything from issue one. It's kind of like a, a whole new storyline. We don't have any of the Omega Red stuff with the vampires. What we have here is kind of like somebody is able to like control mutants. I don't know if it's like tele telepathy. You have this pale girl who kind of looks like an Emma Frost type of character. And it looks like she's able to, like I said, control mutants to do her bidding. It looks like they're stealing uh, the petals or whatever they, whatever they call it, like the Krakoan drugs from the Marauder. And Wolverine gets caught up kind of like Old Man Logan style here. So it was definitely an enjoyable issue, but I don't know what happened with the stories from the first book. Then we got X-Men issue 9. This is kind of continuing the storyline from the New Mutants. I think it was issue 8 or 9 and X-Men 9 with the whole brood thing and the King Egg thing. So they're out in space. You have Star Jammers. You have Shyar, Brood, X-Men. Uh, pretty fun stuff. I mean... It was, it was pretty good. All right, we got Chip Zdarsky on this X-Men Fantastic Four issue three. Artwork by Dodson, Dodson, and you got Martin. So, man, you know, I, I was thinking about what I was going to say about this book, and it feels a little weird, man. It's kind of like this whole battle over Franklin Richards, who's Reed Richards' son, who's also a mutant. Reed Richards was dampening his powers almost to the point where he won't even have any mutant powers and he finds out uh, Franklin gets pissed and runs away. At the same time, the mutants want him on Krakoa because the mutants want all mutants to live on Krakoa. And it kind of just seems like the Fantastic Four and the X-Men should be able to talk this out a little bit better as heroes and as good people. Even though, I mean, Magneto is kind of on the island there. They actually ha get deserted on the island uh, that's part of Latveria. So Doom shows up, which gets interesting. Uh, Doom has some tricks up his sleeve, and he wants to help, obviously, Franklin reach his full potential. He's got a soft spot for the kids, for uh, Val and Franklin. But it just seems like uh, the Fantastic Four and the X-Men are acting a little bit out of character here. I think the next issue is the last one to wrap up this miniseries. And due to the events in this issue, I think they're going to actually uh, put their differences aside and combine forces for their one uh, true enemy. Hickman hits us with another giant size X-Men book. This is uh, giant size X-Men Nightcrawler, which it was interesting, man. They actually have to go back to uh, Xavier's mansion. It seems like it's haunted. Uh, they go there and sure enough, you kind of see little glimpses of uh, past X-Men. Actually, you can see glimpses of them, of them on the cover. So we'll just say it is uh, Phoenix, uh, Rachel Summers, and Thunderbird. So I'm not going to spoil what happens, but I really like this issue. Like the other giant size, there was no dialogue. This one was uh, definitely a worth, uh, worth a pickup here. All right, so we have the first book in our Empire event that's happening. This is The Road to Empire by Thompson and Day Luis. I really enjoyed this book. So this book kind of focuses on this scroll family that's undercover on Earth. Uh, they end up having a, a mother, a father, and three daughters. Uh, and it's told through their eyes, and they're retelling the events of the Kree Scroll War, the Celestial Madonna, the Young Avengers stuff, and it all leads to where they are heading with this Empire story. I don't really want to spoil what happens because this is going to be a big event, it looks like. Marvel's really uh, promoting this heavily in all these books. But the artwork on the main story, like of the Cree, uh, I'm sorry, of the Scroll family, it looks amazing, very lifelike. I thought the artwork was incredible. I liked how they kind of recapped all these uh, Cree and Scroll events over like the past Marvel history to kind of catch us up as readers and to let us know where they're going with the story. But I'm excited. I think it's going to be a good one. Garth Ennis on Punisher Soviet issue six. This is the final issue of the series. So we wrapped up Curse of the White Knight. We're wrapping up Punisher. Brutal. There were so many panels that had me like, damn, out loud. You know what I mean? So it was awesome. I liked it. It wrapped up the story. The artwork was incredible. The The violence was to the max. No pun intended. Uh, <laughs> damn. 
Marvel Max and Punisher, no pun intended. Damn, I'm on a roll. Awesome series, man. Pick this up if you have it in singles or, or catch it in a trade, but I definitely was digging Punisher Soviet. All right, real quick, Star Wars Bounty Hunters issue two. You know, Marvel sent me a review copy of issue one, so I read it, and I'm reading Darth Vader and Star Wars, so I thought I would keep picking it up. And the thing is, like, the artwork is good, uh, the story is exciting, but I don't really know who any of the characters are, so I'm not really that interested in it. Uh, I know Boba Fett, he gets, like, a little cameo, but that's about it, so I don't think I'm going to keep picking it up. All right, jumping over to Ravencroft, issue three. So Ravencroft uh, takes place after the events of Absolute Carnage. They've rebuilt Ravencroft. Kingpin is the mayor. He's in charge of everything. He's got his cabal of uh, security guards, Hobgoblin. Uh, Taskmaster and more and this issue was pretty cool though because you have Punisher which um, he, he's uh, locked up in Ravencroft and uh, we get a nice little standoff with Punisher and we see these kind of uh, monsters and creatures that Kingpin has been hiding underneath Ravencroft they're making their move in this issue so it was pretty cool. Scream Curse of Carnage issue 5 who's on this Chapman Brown so this is uh, interesting you know this is the only book that really feels like it's in the aftermath of absolute carnage because you have Scream, you have her with um, Andy and, and the the ex Mayhem character, and they're fighting the mother, the mother of the of Grendel, the Grendel, this big huge symbiote that's been underwater uh, for some time now. They have a final showdown battle with them, uh, and Gr the mother keeps saying how God is coming. It's kind of like the only comic that's still talking about that because i don't even think venom has been talking about that they've been doing the venom island thing but uh you know we really want to see what happens when noel finally shows up feels like this is going to be bridging the gap from the absolute carnage stuff until when noel actually shows up you had a cool intro with thor fighting the uh mother of the grendel back in the day and some cool stuff with andy and aunt may at the um is it the feast i think is the shelter where she's been staying at so if you're into the symbiote stuff, this one is still giving it to you live. All right, so then we have by Kelly Thompson, Jessica Jones, Blind Spot, Issue 6. This starts off, uh, I don't know if it's a new arc. It feels like one of those in-between issues. The issue, uh, issues 1 through 5 arc is definitely over with, with that whole um, girlfriend, boyfriend, giving the powers thing or whatever that was. This one, I really did enjoy it, though. It kind of felt like a Spider-Man issue, just like a... A one-shot, almost funny kind of thing, like fighting enemies with witty remarks. I do like the relationship between Jessica Jones and Luke Cage and their daughter. It's their daughter's birthday. Uh, it was just kind of a fun issue. I mean, they destroyed their, their apartment fighting villains and everything, but... Uh, I really enjoy Jessica Jones as a character. I think she's an awesome, unique character. And uh, I like the way Kelly Thompson writes her. All right, check this out. My pick of the week. This is going to surprise some of you guys, man. Immortal Hulk issue 33 man i am so glad that i kind of stuck it out with the immortal hulk this issue was amazing visually was impressive it had so many double page spreads with so much color and and the artwork was amazing who does the artwork on this bennett you got ewing as the writer and this also wraps up the arc with uh Zemu and roxon and that minotaur guy thank god this guy is hopefully not going to show up anymore but i really like the uh inner battle within Bruce Banner who's been acting crazy ever since Zen Mew arrived and you have the hulks within his head kind of trying to break free some hulks are trying to keep hulks contained some hulks want hulk to be hulk and that whole thing hulk is hulk it was an awesome issue man I really liked it I'm glad I stuck it out and I'm excited to see where they go moving forward all right guys that is the last new comic book day reviews hopefully for not that long I mean, I'm still dropping daily content. You know I have a lot of variety of stuff anyway, so this was always just like a once-a-week uh, kind of thing. But I enjoy it. I really like being up-to-date with where comics are, so we'll see what happens. Uh, if I get any news, maybe I'll do a GMC news uh, brief on it. Uh, guys, make sure you are subscribed to this channel. You know we're doing the giveaway for that Thanos. Uh, once we hit the 75,000 subscriber milestone, we're getting close. So make sure you're subscribed. Comment on this video if you want to be entered or for a chance to be entered into that giveaway. And let me know what you guys thought about the last week of comics. Stay minty fresh. Peace.